Thank you all for coming today. Uh, welcome to Planted and the sixth of our talks in the series Natural Abundance and Natural Waste here in Granary Square, King's Cross. As the only events and media company dedicated to promoting nature-based businesses and organizations, Planted is committed to affecting climate justice through inspirational and educational editorial content. Through our series of talks and events, we aim to make the commercial case for sustainability and regenerative approaches to all aspects of our lives to create cleaner, greener, happier and healthier futures for us all. Today, we're talking Wasted Spaces, which has been generously sponsored by Five Rivers. And in the talk, we're going to be investigating how we can rewild and reimagine our cities to support biodiversity loss, to create happier, healthier places, more resilient cities that will mitigate the effects of climate change. And I'm delighted to welcome alongside me a series of experienced, knowledgeable, enthusiastic, and no doubt very talkative and possibly argumentative uh, panelists today. Um, I think it's going to be a really fascinating conversation that I'm going to hope to keep under control in some form or shape, but I don't entirely know. So, uh, firstly, I'd like to welcome David Mooney from the London Wildlife Trust. Um, I'd like to welcome Sean Moxham from Rewild My Street and Dusty Gedge, who is a well-known green roof doyen or guru, one or the other. Um, what I'm going to do is ask each of our panelists to introduce themselves for five to seven minutes, and then we're going to have a series of questions and conversations, and then if we've got time at the end, some questions from you, the audience. So I'd like to kick off asking David to introduce himself and tell us a little bit more about what he does at the London Wildlife Trust. David, uh, microphone. Hello, everyone. Uh, yeah, so my name's David. I am Director of Development at London Wildlife Trust. Um, my responsibility is to, amongst other things, oversee um, the development of partnerships between the public, private, and charity sector to try and um, advance precisely the, 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 the point of this talk. Uh, in London, how can we create wilder spaces? Um, how can we create ecologically rich landscapes whilst also accepting the fact that lots and lots of people live in London and lots of things go on and there's lots of competing pressures on space. Um, London Wildlife Trust is part of a national organization called the Wildlife Trust. Um, we are 46 organizations federated. So I represent and work for the, the London branch, if you like, of the Wildlife Trusts. There's a, there's a Wildlife Trust in every square inch of the UK, Northern Ireland. We have more nature reserves than McDonald's have restaurants. Please remember that. It's a very important fact. You know, we're competing with some serious global uh, pressures. Um, so the, the Wildlife Trusts have a number of consultancies as well. Uh, London has a consultancy, so we, we try and work in partnership with, with developers like Argent, for example, um, trying to support and advocate for good quality design, uh, trying to try and influence and um, create impact within design teams to ensure that as development is designed out from vision, from master planning through to uh, the detailed design and construction and at the end the handover to, to management and maintenance that there is biodiversity and wildlife at the core of the design and I think that's probably the key role that I need to talk about today. Um, I, I, I do many other things as well besides but sitting in design teams trying to influence uh, a range of professionals and specialists, architects, landscape architects, civil engineers influence them but also encourage them to think like a strategic ecologist so that's that's our big thing strategic ecology 
where can ecology fit, where can wildlife fit, uh, and be an opportunity and part of development rather than seen as a constraint or an issue. Oh God, we've got some great crested newts. How do we get them off site quick? Don't tell anyone. Uh, oh God, there's a there's a nesting peregrine falcon. That's going to be a nightmare for us. It's actually changing that viewpoint and getting to think how can we attract great crested newts? How can we get peregrine falcons to live and and and, and exist within development? Because we think fundamentally, I think fundamentally, and I've thought this all of my life as a Londoner, born and bred in Islington, that London should be alive with nature and can be alive with nature if everyone just thinks about it for a second and thinks about that natural inheritance that we're born with, that natural connection we have with nature as we're children. We don't have to teach children it, we, that we're born with it. We just forgotten it we were disconnected we have a fundamental disconnect with the natural world um, and how do we fix it is is principally what we're trying to do at London Wildlife Trust with the consultancy how do we get people to remember that feeling of being in a natural green space feel passionate about it and come out of their silo come out of their specialism and think well I might be a civil engineer and I might think about road cross sections or my all, all my working day, but how can I be a strategic ecologist? What can I do within my specialism? How can I reach out to others to think about ecology and wildlife? That's the challenge we put down. So at London Wildlife Trust, we do that. We also, lest we forget, create nature reserves. We have 36 nature reserves in London, one of which is about 250 meters over there. It's called Camley Street Natural Park. You must, after this talk, walk around there over a little bridge and you'll see a wonderful natural oasis of biodiverse rich woodland that's created by London Wildlife Trust. Uh, we've been there since 1983. I haven't, but, um, but the London Wildlife Trust has. All this is developed around us um, and we have all along had a nature reserve that's I think in many ways influenced some of the big players around here. Um, my final point is we have influenced people around here through nature reserves like that. We're now designing the, the green roof up on, on Google there. So we are creating a nature reserve not dissimilar. The, the initial idea was to recreate that nature reserve on that roof. And we, we're doing pretty well. We've, um, we've got a strong working relationship with the design team. And that's, that's what we do. Uh, I'm sure I'm going on and on and on, but... Not at all. I'll hand over. No, let's hand over to Sean, though. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sean Moxon. I'm an academic. I teach sustainable design at London Metropolitan University. I'm also an architect, and I carry out design research into urban rewilding. And I created the Rewild My Street campaign... Uh, which provides guidance for residents who are keen to adapt their homes, gardens and streets to make them better for wildlife and for people and to stop our cities going grey. And I've brought along a, a giant postcard reimagining uh, London as a, a wildlife haven and an urban jungle. And it's addressed to you. Uh, I also have normal size versions that you can come and pick up at the end, but I would like to read out um, my message from the future. London, 2041. I'm visiting our city in the future, a haven for nature and people. City retail and office plots, emptied by increased home working, are now pocket parks, lined with green walls, buzzing with bees. Concrete squares have become tiny forests, bringing shade from our hotter climate and sheltering red squirrels. Wild play streets have replaced suburban car parking, so kids can discover storks and other fauna on their doorstep. On the Wild Belt Trail that now encircles the city, I spotted wolf and lynx from its habitat towers. 
Now I'm inspired to explore the wider region with its landscape shaped by beavers to control flooding. I'll take the slow ways for pedestrians, cyclists, canoeists and wildlife that connect the city to the even wilder landscapes beyond. Wish you were here. Wow. Lovely. Thank you. Hope I'm alive in 2040. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my name's Dusty Gedge and I think um, uh, I'll give you the official stuff. Um, I'm the, somebody said I'm the doyen of Green Roos and, uh, the other day, which sort of sounded a very grand term for a dodgy geezer from South East London. But hey, I'll take it, you know. But I'm, I'm also the president of the European Federation of Green Roof and Wall Associations. Uh, and I, I do a lot of things to do with Green Roofs. Um, but it's great being here because actually one of my first commercial jobs was uh, here uh, in 1999 uh, where Camden asked me to write the planning condition for this regeneration uh, project and then Arjun asked me to write the report to get them out of the planning condition so it's interesting being here and at that time I've been a bird watcher all my life I used to be a, a circus for an actor and uh, that's what I used to do um, I was once a punk as well and I used to like to say I went from a punk to a president but you can't take the punk out of the president because there's still a bit of me like that yeah but the point there is I was a bird watcher and I got involved in a project down in Deptford we found this rare bird and we decided, well, why don't we put the habitat up on the roof because they're going to build there. And the bird's called a black red star. And there was lots of black red stars here. And I was then a volunteer with the London Wildlife Trust. And um, everybody said, you can't do that. So I flew to Switzerland 22 years ago to find out why they could do it and we couldn't do it. And through that process, I became, I think, uh, a bit of an expert. I sat on lots of technical committees. But a lot of the policies and the guidance on green roofs in London, in the United Kingdom, has come from my laptop. <laughs> um, but that's me. But as I say, I, I like to say to people, I'm just a geezer from South East London who likes nature and wanted to make a difference. And with the support of the London Wildlife Trust and a lot of the conservation bodies, in the early noughties, we had a really big effect. And I was an environmental activist who campaigned for a policy, and the policy was written in 2008. And that's the punk in me even though I'm a president. But the thing that's got me about this is it's not just a London thing or an urban thing. Is I was originally going to be an ecologist when I was younger. We have a problem in our community, the ecological community, because there's a lot of culture about going back to a lost Eden. We need to make landscapes for the future not for the past and so when you start to look at rules and they're quite constrained places you start to learn actually you can create habitats which are really really interesting and to take you out of london to a very interesting place from my childhood is sea salter cockle shell beach i could take a photograph of that beach and take a photo of a green good green roof and you wouldn't know the difference between the two of them and that's a natural habitat out in the wider env environment the other thing about when you're in a city like London over the 20 years, we're slowly blur blurring the boundaries between what is allowable to be wild and let's be quite frank, formal landscape, which is, you know, nice hedge, nice lawn, nice tree. We've done our bit. And the landscapes of the future are going to have to be landscapes which can cope with heat waves. They're going to have to be landscapes that can cope with a lot of rain. And that's not necessarily what was here 500 years ago when it was its natural Eden type, which is not to take away from, let's say, what the London Wildlife Trust does when there's sites which need preserving, like Saltbox Hill, which is a classic pre-Second World War calcareous grassland. Let's look after it. But let's also, in our city, look at how we can deliver for biodiversity but make landscapes that are for the future, not the past. Perfect. Thank you for those introductions. So, as a, as a biophilic designer, we, we take an evolutionary sort of perspective on the built environment, recognizing that as human beings, we existed in close connection to nature for hundreds of thousands of years for our basic human survival. 
And that connection to nature influenced the way we thought about buildings and villages and, uh, and everything. But, you know, fast forward several thousand years and we find ourselves in the midst of dense, noisy, built-up, geometric urban environments that are quite clearly sick for us and sick for the planet. So, I mean, when do you think we started to turn our back on nature and, and recognize its value in our lives? I spoke to this when you, we had a telephone call. It's very interesting, you go down to Soho, there's a monument to, I can't remember his name, but he was the guy who discovered that cholera was some kind of virus. And literally from there, we started to asphalt and concrete our city because of cholera. And I always go there and I go like, yeah, that was really important in the 17th, 18th century, but we don't need to be so clinical about our place now because we've dealt with that. But I think that's, to me, where it started. And there were good reasons, you know. And just very finally, I don't want to dwell, is the Parks movement came out of the idea that cholera might be a miasma, and parks were good at dissipating miasma. So the disease... What is a, a miasma? A miasma was... Like, they thought... I don't really know, actually, but they thought, you know, these things bounced around in the air and did whatever they did. But, you know, a lot of the way the city is designed is actually about disease from 300 years ago. And, Sean... I when did architecture start to turn its back on nature? So I, I think it starts with where we live and with our residential streets and with kind of incremental changes that individuals are making that all add up to have a, a bad effect. Um, so I think with people paving over their front gardens, taking down hedges and um, trees, laying artificial back lawns, Gardens cover about a quarter of most cities, so that has a really big effect when it kind of all adds up across um, all those gardens that could be a quite large area of significant habitat when you think about them all joined together. And David? I mean, I'm, I fundamentally agree with Dusty. Like that, the, the, that was the kind of point at which we, we were scared of the natural world became. The natural world was something that would kill us. I mean, that, that is a really key point. I think in more modern times, when we really started to double down on our, on our disconnect, was, or, and, and still rem in some ways remains the, what I call a policy clash, the push for and the consequence of, of the, our housing policy of more and more housing, that, that we constantly hear about needing more housing, we need to build more houses without reflecting on the broken private rental market, the broken housing market in this country, without fundamentally tackling a completely non-wildlife uh, issue of housing policy, the, the impact of that, you know, we need 3, 350,000 more homes, more homes every year, the, the impact of that on the natural world and on our ability to create green spaces, wild green spaces, is really quite profound. There's not enough space for all of the things that come with needing more houses. So the policy clash, as I talk about, is the need for road infrastructure, the need for um, recreational space, the need for play, formal play, the need for... Um, or the community facilities that come with new housing. There are lots and lots, if you look, go into the, the realms of planning policy in Camden, for example, there'll be loads and loads of policies that have to be met for new housing. And so there's no space for nature. There's literally things are squeezed to the point where we, we're trying to design in wildlife rich landscapes, right, in parks. And then you get someone saying, well, what about a football pitch? What about the, uh, the community facility? What about the road? What about the bus network? That's all true, but that leaves us squeezed out. And so we end up squeezing out nature. There's no space for genuinely wild spaces in, in the city through, through housing policy. So we have to go back to something that's not to do with this talk, and we probably should have another talk about it another time, which is the pressure of our obsession with building more homes without realizing that there are plenty of homes that exist, but that's for another day.
Well, we're going to put that on our list. But for now, I mean, what, what's the, what are the dangers of squeezing nature out of our lives and our cities? What, what's the impact of that nature deprivation? What's the thing is what we do is live we live in very grey black cities, which have problems. We have urban heat island effect. We have we just throw all the rainwater into the stormwater sewage, and then we put the sewage into the river. That's historically what we've done. If we then say what the whole idea of nature-based solutions is, what service does nature provide? But it's not so difficult. To, it's not as easy to quantify as all the other things. But if you go around to Camley Street, do, and actually on the road running up to Camley Street, there's all these rain gardens. They are there to capture rainwater. There should be rain gardens all over London. That is nature-based solution, and it will have a positive benefit on biodiversity, not necessarily technical species, but it will have a benefit. I wanted to put some along Black Eve, and all the nature people said, no, you can't do that, you're, you're harming Black Eve. And then they said, oh, you're at the top of the hill, so it's not a problem. I said, that water eventually goes into the Thames. So that's where we should start. But the service that nature provides, cooling, storing rainwater, then you've got health and well-being, and then what Dave and I are into, biodiversity. That's its service. What services can we provide to a grey city that is going to need to adapt to climate change? Sean. Yeah, so Dusty's absolutely right. I think um, nature, if we're deprived of nature, it's not good for our soul, but it's also not good for how the city works. And increasingly with climate change, hotter, drier summers, warmer, wetter winters, more kind of extreme weather events, we're going to need nature to help us deal with that. And it, the way rewilding is seen in the city needs to be a bit different to the way it's seen in the countryside. It's not, it's not a kind of pure thing, but it's about a concept that um, is, yes, about helping whatever biodiversity we can and being part of the solution to the national global biodiversity crisis. But it's also about just making our cities work for us and for our own health and well-being, I think during the pandemic, we all kind of noticed the importance of that connection with nature, even if it's just a view out of our window or a walk in a local space that we didn't know was there before. Um, and like you say, it's intangible, but it's something that we all know is true, that we need that um, connection with nature to be our, our best selves and our cities need it to be our best cities. And David, you're going to know firsthand what the effect of a nature-deprived space looks like. Uh, I, I was looking at some of the historical pictures of Camley Street, and I mean, it was a it was a sort of coal dumping waste ground, wasn't it? I mean, so so, are you still seeing and finding those sites that have a complete nature deficit? Um, just tell us a little bit about what those spaces look and feel like, and and the impact they have on the city around them. I mean. I'm, I'm sure you can. You, all of us can name some some pretty de ecologically desolate places. Um, most of our, dare I say it, parks are, are pretty ecologically dead. Um, the the sight of gang mowers, you know, those big multi mowers on the back of a tractor, going over my local park, Finsbury Park, once a month. The entire grass bank is is mown. There's, there's nothing survives. Um, so just in my local park, it's pretty desolate. Um, in in lots of parts of London, there's there's a really really limited lacking lack of green space. I think the the the, the story of Camden Street is quite an interesting, really interesting one. It was a, it was a coal drop. It was a coal next to coal drops yard. It was a, there was a smaller coal drop on Camden Street um, for 200 years. It's a um, really contaminated site. But when it, it stopped being used as a coal storage space, it fell into to disrepair and, and was fenced off and then was a fly tip for many, many years. We have wonderful photography, wonderfully depressing photography from the 1970s of, of it being just a, a dump. Um, and we took it over and, and 
turned it into a, a, a wildlife oasis in 1983. I think that's a really important point. Like we, we have had some successes over the years in, in, with this story. This isn't something for the future. There are things to look to from the past, and not just in London. There are uh, 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 cities all over the world that have done some really inspiring things with some pretty desolate, um, uh, forgotten corners. Another, I mean, if, can I give you one more example? Go ahead. Um, I think we, we forget about our utility land, whether it's um, railway lines or, or reservoirs. We worked tirelessly to campaign to open a reservoir in Hackney um, in 2016. We turned it into a a, a wildlife oasis, a, a wetland with a vibrant reed bed and, and um, over 35 breeding pairs of reed warbler that travel over from West Africa before we turned that into what is now Woodbury Wetlands. Um, it had chlorine and ammonia pumped into the, to the water to keep it clean and it was cut with a gang mower just like Frinsbury Park with an inch of its life and we worked with Thames Water I mean, we 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 have sometimes have to dance with with those um, particular companies, and now have created a, a, a wildlife rich, wondrous green space that people, when they turn up, don't realise it's still a functioning, operating reservoir. So there are lots of little corners on roofs that we can do this if we just convince ourselves and and have uh, be a bit brave. Go ahead. Well, it's a perceptual technical point because you were talking about dumping grounds and wasteland. Wasteland is ecologically brilliant, but we don't like the look of it. And that's the conflict in a city. And I'm, I like my wastelands that still exist. There's not many in London, but that's difficult for the general public to perceive. Wastelands are good ecologically. It's how we balance that perceptually. When we spoke, Dusty, you mentioned the cost-benefit analysis of greening London. Were you just having a bad day? Or was that? Could you explain what, what that might look or sound like? Uh, no, what I think I was saying is it's really difficult to cost-benefit analysis, analyse nature with the current model because we don't put in all the services that nature provides. The current model is to be, dare I say it, is a bit of a fossil, fossil fuel model. It's a, it's a model that was designed to for the fossil fuel age. It's, it's not a model that's designed for nature-based solution age. And even if you go to the commission, EU Commission, you go to learning bodies, we're still trying to work out how we can cost benefit and analyze nature-based solutions because it doesn't work in the current format. That's a challenge, that's a cultural shift. Okay, so I'm gonna move the conversation on and I think we've got th three different perspectives on, on how we introduce and enhance cities with nature. So what I'd like to do is just ask you, you know, what does good look like from your particular background and perspective? Um, so, David, what does good look like for a rewilded space? I mean, I'm obviously going to provide a really, really biased answer here. It's 200 metres over there. Um, and just to, to Dusty's point, I genuinely mean that. I know it sounds really quite facetious, but I didn't build it, by, by the way. You know, this is 1983, so I'm celebrating our... Our, um, my, my predecessors, but um, what what really good looks like is um, uh, we built a new building recently, a visitor centre, uh, architecturally kind of quite fancy for us, um, but we knocked down our old shed, our old classroom and our old kind of run down portaloo. We knocked it all down, dug up all the foundations, but we didn't take any of it off site. We mounded it up, shaped it in quite a nice mound, when you go and have a look, we've shaped it in the in this the, in this kind of an envelope or a hug or, that wraps in the um, the arms of the bridge. That's all rubble. That's the the rubble that Dusty's talking about. That's the the waste material. We didn't take any of it off site. We we lightly um, sprinkled it with some loamy soil, a bit of sand, only about three or four centimeters thick, and we laid down the challenge to the landscape architect who were wor working with us say look this is your substrate this is what we want you to to build on this is open mosaic habitat this is brownfield this is wasteland habitat that we want you to create here you say, sorry when you say mosaic what does, the, what does that an mean? open mosaic um is bits of bare ground maybe sand bit of old bricks rubble um there'll be some 
some bare earth and then pioneer succession planting so species that that can really grow in resilient stressful sunburn you know free draining soil and said we need in the heart of london in king's cross that is going to be our permanent um example of what good design looks like and by the way it is it is designed there's some some flowing planting it's kind of a chelsea flower show-esque garden but in permanency um on really poor substrate and we take developers there all so, the time so and part, say you part, can do this part of good it's not just supporting biodiversity but but getting people onto that space to enjoy and connect with nature, is that? That's absolutely the fundamental mission of London Wildlife Trust. We're, we're not about creating nature reserves, putting fence around it and saying, either join as a member, because you can't get in, otherwise well, you can pay if you want to. All our nature reserves are completely free all, the, all year round. That's absolutely not an organisation I would ever work for. Because part of the, going back to your previous question, part of the disconnect is this idea that nature is over there, it's f something you visit on a Saturday or an afternoon or after your Sunday lunch, and you pay to get in and you look at it, it's kind of zoo-like mentality, that has contributed to our breakdown with, with the natural world. So, yes, absolutely allowing people seven days a week to go and have a look. And from the bridge, you don't have to go in. Oh, there's a lovely cafe there, but you don't have to go in. There's a really nice sp example of urban nature conservation in action. Great. I'd, I'd like to move it on. Um, Sean, your work in, in Rewild My Street, tell me what a good nature-infused street looks and feels like. Uh, it looks like this. <laughs> so, so for the people at the back, though, I mean, I'd, let's, uh, say, yeah. let's take a typical Victorian terrace street. How might we infuse nature uh, in, in a really positive way? So I think it's about small changes that everyone can make that all add up. So having mini meadows, having uh, container ponds, having green roofs and, and just simple climbers to create green walls. Thinking about that issue of space and how you can make the most of that. Having a green roof on your bin store or your bike store or your window box or a pond on your balcony. Um, bird boxes, bat boxes integrated within the roof tiles within the walls of your garden or your house. Um, it's about doing lots of little things that all add up across a house, across a street, across a neighborhood, across a city um, to, to form a network. And I think design is really important for this issue about um, perception and, and tackling uh, people's resistance, particularly aesthetic resistance to um, this idea of urban rewilding. So I think things like contrasting the kind of uh, messier mini meadow with a kind of really neat edging or mowing a path through it, showing that things are deliberate and they're cared for and they're done for a reason. And if that doesn't work, then signposting rewilding is really good. So things like the Blue Heart scheme, where you put up a sign to say, this is rewilding, this isn't neglect, this isn't me being a nature a sort of neighbor who's lazy and messy this is a deliberate meaningful important thing and all of this stuff is possible in in this kind of traditional london architecture vernacular that, that we're so familiar with i mean 80 percent of the built environment that we've got now will still be here by 2050 so we're not going to be building a massive amount more i mean we can actually do all this stuff right now can we exactly and that's that's important and that's why I'm focusing on existing residential streets because that's the bit that's really overlooked by policy um, and regulation because it's impossible to control through that. So it has to be done by people taking action and realising the importance of, of the contribution of their own gardens or outdoor spaces to, to this solution. And great. Uh, Dusty, uh, t tell us what good looks like in your world. <laughs> well, I, you know, on a personal level, if you drive over Blackheath, um, nothing to do with me, Lewis and Greenwich made these, exactly what Dave talked about up at Cameron Street, these mounds of rubble with a little bit of loam on seeded with wildflowers. The first one we went in in 2004. They look absolutely beautiful. If I tweet about them, commuters say to me, best part of my journey into town is blah, blah. Not that you should be driving. That's good. 
Now, also, what's good is when you go to a street, as you've just described, and you see there's a bit of a meadow, there's a bit of this, and there's a bit of that, and there's a bit of that, because it's breaking our conventions. And so, you know, there's not one good, there's lots of goods. And the thing about biodiversity is the word diversity. And that's a diversity of solutions. And, you know, I'm going to reiterate what I just said. It's one of the challenges we had in terms of open mosaic is how can you create that ecologically so it looks good? It's possible to do. That's all what design's about. But that requires the ecologist or the nature people to have some, you know, be at the top of the conversation, not at the bottom of the conversation, because that's normally how it is. And I'm just going to move on, because you asked the question, it's about space. Obviously, I do roofs, that's what I do. 32% of central London can be green tomorrow. Now, that is about climate change adaptation, urban heat island effects, sustainable urban drainage, and biodiversity. It's just how are we going to fund it? And that's just central London. You could say that 32% of um, Lewisham Town Centre, 32% of Woolwich Town Centre. You just go to all the town centres where there's no pitched roofs. There's a heck of a lot of space in London. I just want to make one final point. The trouble is with the biodiversity green roofs is when they go in, the planners say, oh, nobody's allowed on them. And during COVID, I was on Blackheath. Everybody sat in the long grass. But as soon as you say you can go on a roof, it has to be box hedge and whatever. People like meadows. You go to an extensive green roof in Berlin, you can sit beside it. But we, we sort of, we like to differentiate. And that is one of the problems, I've got to say, with the, uh, with the installation of green roofs, just the, the lack of access visually or, or experientially i mean we can sit on a green we can sitting here it's a green roof that you worked on yeah which is just in that that cafe over there but nobody can actually you can't even see the green roof um nobody can actually experience it and for me there's a little bit of a sort of like well what's the way up should we be putting our money into supporting biodiversity or, or that experience of getting people engaged with nature. So obviously a lot of money being spent on this stuff, but if nobody can see it and experience it, we're not experiencing all of those sort of immediate psychological, physiological health and well-being benefits. Very quickly to answer that, both. Get people on roofs, get biodiversity there, make the city better. I mean, should we be putting our money into green roofs or, or transforming those lost We need spaces? to put our money into green in the city everywhere do you agree david i mean you should we where would you like the money to be going sort of green roofs that people can't access or was there far greater value in engaging people and communities both you're not going to get me on one or the other you, you're going to have to have but whether but the, so we can aff, developers can afford to put green roofs on like it's part of their it's part of their program it doesn't even touch the sides of the the cost um, I don't get why access isn't just default. I mean, public access, may, I don't know, maybe some private uh, companies, Universal here, have a, have a green roof just up there. I don't know why they don't allow the public up there. There's, they'll have some staff up there, but uh, I, uh, I think, so to answer the green roof thing, they, everyone could, it, it's easily done, just as a default. If developers become comfortable and, and understand that it's not going to be a big uh, drain on their on their finance, um, public spaces on the ground level, accessible public spaces, there's enough money. There's plenty of money. Um, it it's again it green spaces have to be built as part of development. There's a thirty percent requirement of open space. It's again getting design teams around the tables, getting local authorities confident. That's the half of the problem. They don't understand what wild looks like and exactly what Sean's talking about. It, it looks unkempt aesthetically. It looks forgotten about. And local authorities panic about that because the, they think they're the ones going to get complaints because, oh, you don't care about my green space. You're not pruning it and doesn't look nice. And it's a, that's all part of the journey. Local authority council officers are also not convinced that wild looks good 
So it's convincing them as well and help and bringing them on the journey. And Sean, um, what role do communities play in facilitating green infrastructure or the rewilding of our cities? Because obviously, if you've got a street that you're trying to create a, a green corridor on, it only really takes one or two houses next to each other to break the flow. So how do you how do you actually engage a community to understand the value of nature and then engage them to, to actuate it? Yep, so I think um, it's about letting them know that they have the power to make a difference and that their contribution through whatever they can do on their own space is valuable both to them and to the city and, and to wildlife and is going to add up to something. Um, I think there's a lot of kind of community spirit and WhatsApp groups that have kind of come out of um, the pandemic and that kind of thing. So that's all helpful. Um, but that's what I'm trying to do really through my Rewild My Street website is provide a kind of strategic tool, if you like, that people can then take away and do things them themselves so that lots of people, um, as long as they know it's out there, can access it to, to make small, small changes and hopefully tell their neighbours and talk to them about having a gap in the fence so hedgehogs can get through because they need... So, I mean, quite often space. it's very simple things that are... Yeah. yeah, I mean, there are more don't. radical things too. Yeah. The idea is that you don't have to be radical. Dusty. Yeah, in support of that, but also in a bigger way. Yeah, 20 years ago, you got big developments going up and, you know, it was landscape is a problem, it costs money and doesn't sell houses. And if you do all these micro things on the street, I'm absolutely guaranteed the house prices are going to go up. Yeah, so this is just pure money. Yeah. You know, and I don't earn a huge amount of money. And one of the great things about Barclay Homes, which the London Wildlife Trust do work with, I'm not with the Wildlife Trust now, down near me, Kidbrook Village. Kidbrook Village, I stand up on stage, and Barclay Homes have delivered something fantastic. They haven't done it out of kindness. They know nature sells properties. And that's what's really interesting nature sells properties and they're doing it they've done kidbrook village really quite well and i used to hate them and close down their sites and cause them loads of problems but you then go they're doing something good because it sells the property but it also delivers so money and the street thing if you green up your street for nature i'm sure the streets property prices are going to go up uh, I mean, Maybe I think, I think the, research, no, no, the, the research does support that, and it says that actually that uh, streets with green infrastructure, trees and plants, ha have an increased uh, value of about 5%, yeah. 3 to 5%. Um, so, obviously, things are moving from a financial perspective. We've talked a little bit about government legislation. Um, there are sort of new terms coming up that I'd like to just uh, have you explain to the audience. Um, could you explain the concepts of the urban greening factor and also biodiversity net gain? I know that you've had an involvement in writing this, and you told me that when we spoke. So now you have to explain to the audience, Dusty. Right, I, might let, I might let you do biodiversity net gain. Yeah, well, gain, we can David, split them. Yeah. 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 Right, biodiversity net gain is a bit complicated. I'll mention where I'm at with it. Uh, the urban greening factor is, is a very simple tool that is now pan, your, uh, pan London. Uh, and I was involved writing it for London and for the city. It's basically a scoring mechanism to make sure that the development has got the right amount of greening, because the local authority sets you know, 0 0.5, and if the design comes in and it's only got 0 0.4, it's not necessarily fit for purpose. So it's, it's also sophisticated enough to say, like in the city of London where there's a conservation area, historic conservation area, where you might not be able to green as much for good reason, they lower the score. So it's 0 0.3. But the idea of the urban greening factor is to ensure that every new development has the kind of green infrastructure that the city of London wants or the London borough Camden wants. That's, that's what the urban greening factor is. In terms of biodiversity net gain, in terms of London, I'll let um, uh, ground level, David may be going to it, it's going to be almost impossible to get biodiversity net gain without having a green roof in central London. And the metric is designed to deliver not basic seed and roofs, but the metric is designed biodiversity and wildflowers. I wrote the metric. <laughs> David, did you want to comment on that? Uh, yeah, so biodiversity net gain is a, it, it's a mandatory requirement from November next year. A developer has to ensure that there's 
10% more biodiversity value, which is essentially a, a habitat score, than before they started. So, for example, and uh, I have to say it, this development would not have hit a 10% biodiversity net, get, net gain score, and neither would it have got an urban greening factor score, the requirement for the, the point 0.3 of the surfaces, both uh, vertical and horizontal, need to be of, green, of a green organic nature. Uh, so this would have, would have not got planning. What you see around you would have required a lot more. There would have been a, the need for more rain gardens, for example. So this entire square would have, would have drained into a series of rain gardens, which then get a score, both urban greening and also a net gain condition score and something that Dusty and the Wildlife Trust have been lobbying for and campaigning for for almost a decade and it's now coming into planning policy. So we not only have a kind of moral um, carrot with which to kind of convince developers, we also have a stick with which to beat them uh, in a year's time. And is the, the, the London Rewilding Task Force going to enforce that? What's their role? No, nope. the London Rewilding Task Force is a, a, a group set up by the Mayor of London to uh, define what rewilding means for London. Rewilding is a really quite uh, specific term in our in our world of uh, kind of allowing stuff, allowing nature to do to go back to do its thing. So it can happen quite easily in. The uplands of Scotland. If you if you allow if you prevent sheep grazing, for example, uh, and manage the deer population, over time, the Scottish Highlands will rewild back to pine forest without much intervention. Rewilding in London requires a significant amount of intervention and a certain set of parameters through which we can say yes, that's a rewilding project. No, that's a green infrastructure or an urban nature conservation project. Rewilding is going to, there's, there's no prizes for guessing what the conclusions of the task force are going to be, but rewilding is going to tend to focus more on greater London, outer London, and the green belt. And we're going, we are as part of that uh, panel, not myself, but a colleague, going to push the agenda around what the, what the use of the green belt is and really start asking some difficult questions about the green belt. Is it green? Is it functioning? Uh, we don't think it is. What can be done about the green belt to rewild it, and how can we repurpose it and, and fund it and, and design it in a such a way that it benefits nature? Because at the moment, it it doesn't. So, looking towards the future, obviously, we're seeing the immediate effects of the climate crisis and biodiversity loss. Uh, only yesterday, uh, whilst we were dry up here in Kings Cross, Brighton would had had the most apocalyptic sort of rainfall, and the streets were flooding. So, how and of course, this summer we've seen un unheard of temperatures of 40 degrees. How are we going to have to rethink um, the introduction of nature into our cities? I mean, should we be looking at native or non-native species? Should we be looking ahead to the predictions of changing temperatures and rainfalls and changing climate? What, what, firstly, I mean, what's going to have to happen in our streets to adapt and make them more cl climate resilient? Um, I think it's a balance between native and non-native because non-native things can be useful to extend the kind of flowering season for pollinators and things like that so they have their place and they might be more adaptable to years when we do get drought. We won't, we'll still get some summers that are a traditional British wet summer so we can't assume that every, every summer is going to be a, a sort of freakishly hot one but they'll occur more and more often. Therefore the kind of need for uh, more trees for shading and for evapotranspirative cooling, uh, more planting um, and more rain gardens to address the kind of heavy rain events that we'll get in more in the winter months are, are going to be critical. Um, and, you know, for me, the, the primary purpose of those is biodiversity, but there's an equally impressing purpose of those, which is for climate resilience of, of cities. And how is your work on the green roofs around London going to have to change, to the, uh, adapt to those changes? Well, the green roofs hopefully will get slightly deeper as it gets hotter, which is what's happening elsewhere in Europe and Germany. They've gone from 150 millimetres to 200 millimetres. The thing is also 
just because you fed me there, because um, I'll come back to plants in a minute, is one of the big things is we've just got to get over is topsoil. Topsoil is terrible stuff. It's just really awful stuff. If you've seen the wildfires out in Barking, that is because of topsoil and grass roots. There was a fire in Greenwich Park. I walked over it, yeah, every single thing that was alive was a wildflower because it's got a deep root. We've got to move away from this historic belief in productivity and topsoil. And it's controversial. And my friend John Little, who some of you may have heard of, not just Google him at Grass Roof, he does all this aggregate-based gardening which survived the heat wave without much watering. That is the future, yeah? Now, in terms of plants, very quickly, there's no... London is full of non-native plants. And if you go to southern Spain, most of the wildflowers that are native to the United Kingdom that I, 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 are part of the seed mix that we, we row are found across Europe. They just will flower earlier. And in the metric I wrote for intensive green roofs, which is rooftop gardens, and it comes from Germany. 50% native, 50% non-native of known wildlife value. Bamboo has no wildlife value, so don't plant it. So th there's a point there where you can do the non-native and the native, but you focus on its value to wildlife. David, any thoughts about adapting to future climate change? Um, I think some some exciting stuff is going to be around around um, around rivers, and um, we need to remember about our, uh, London has I don't know how many well, it's over thirty forgotten, lost, or or culverted rivers and streams. We need to think specifically, and this can go for all cities really. Think more about our streams and brooks and rivers daylighting them, um, as in taking them out of the culvert, re, uh, allowing them to re-meander, allowing them to flood, creating floodplains, uh, so that when there are significant dry periods, 40 degrees, or when there are significant wet periods, uh, our rivers, streams, and associated wetlands are the best places to, to cope with, with, uh, with extreme weather. Um, I'll just give you an example, Gutteridge um, in East, in East uh, West London, one of our nature reserves, Gutteridge Meadows, is a wet meadow, right? Um, it burnt this summer. A wet meadow burnt because uh, the, the, the brook that's supposed to be feeding it uh, was culverted about 10 years ago and it, it's drying up. If that brook was still running through Gutteridge Meadow, and it's, a, and it's a significant space around residential homes, it would have survived and been fine, well, fine, it would, it would have dried up a bit, but it would have been okay. The, the fact that it was a, a light, it was on fire, a wet meadow was on fire, was absolutely disastrous. So it's streams and rivers and brooks for, for me, in, in, in wetlands. Okay, so we're coming to the end of our talk, and um, obviously... I'm conscious that each of you have enormous expertise and knowledge and experience of, you know, best case scenarios. And it would be great if you could just leave our audience with a few things to go and explore further. So, Dusty, if you could just sort of say, you know, go and take a look at this fantastic example of, uh, of a green roof or kind of a whatever. Give us a good example that we can go and visit or explore. Well, if you can get onto IKEA in Greenwich, which I'm not too sure they're allowing people up on the roof anymore, you can actually see what is one of the most interesting green roofs. I've had some involvement in it, but I wasn't involved in the design. Uh, 120 Fenchurch Street. By the way, you mentioned this earlier. The City of London has an aspiration that every single roof garden built as of three years ago is accessible to the public. 120 Fenchurch Street. It's not my kind of green roof, but you can ac access it. If you're a couple, you turn up, you go through security. If you're a group, you need to book. And that's what the city wants, so that goes back to the other thing. And the other thing is I would check out At Grass Roof Co. in terms of these aggregate-based gardening techniques because I think that is a very important part of the future in London and elsewhere because of climate change. Great. And, Sean, I, I know sort of without invading people's privacy, 
Where can they go and see a, a really well managed, rewilded street that's embraced nature? Uh, good question. I, I guess I would look back to ones that are more traditional, like Hampstead Garden suburb, where um, everything's neat and tidy with privet hedges, but there's a lot of kind of green space and wider green spaces around. In terms of more urban ones, I think some of the landscaping around here, although it's quite uh, constrained and contained, does make an effort to introduce that aesthetic of kind of wilder um, planting, so it's interesting to see. Um, and in terms of kind of more urban ones, uh, Thames Barrier Park is, is great in terms of having that balance between wildness and um, some kind of clipping and architectural geometric forms. And don't go there because you'd have to get on a plane. But uh, Paley Park in New York is a really nice pocket park dominated by the, the sound of water and, and some trees, which just shows how you can integrate something right in the center of the, you know, the, most, the biggest cities. And David, you've mentioned uh, Camley Street. Are there others that people can go and visit? I mean, is there like a tour or a map somewhere where they can find out more about local? Yeah, go, go to London Wildlife Trust website. There's um, all of our nature reserves are on there. Um, Woodbury wetlands. The, the restoration of, of or, or the, the reintroduction of nature to reservoirs is really quite an interesting experience at Woodbury in Hackney and in Walthamstow, uh, Waltham Forest, the borough of. Get on the tube at King's Cross and go to Tottenham Hale and walk up, there's a site called Walthamstow Wetlands, which is a, a massive set of reservoirs which we've, we've effectively rewilded. Um, and then, as Dusty mentioned, if you go down to Greenwich, um, what good looks like in terms of new modern parks that are built. Um, Greenwich has a, a site called Kidbrook Village, which is just by Kidbrook Station. If you get on the train, um, there are you have to kind of go through some fairly uh, ropey um, bits of modern urban landscaping in my opinion but you get through to the park itself cater park and sutcliffe park sutcliffe park is the number for me the number one success story in london and that's outside of london wildlife trust work sutcliffe park in greenwich they daylighted a brook the uh, the river quaggy took it from being underground and re-meandered it through the park and created a wetland that stores water when it floods and remains wet when it's really dry Sutcliffe Park if we could do more Sutcliffe Parks around London seriously it's, it's not something that London Wildlife Trust was involved in at all so there's no bias here Sutcliffe Park who was Greenwich. responsible for that one? Dusty Natural England wasn't it? yeah, you can make a comment, it? yeah. You can make uh, Sutcliffe Park was designed when the Ferro Estate was knocked down to protect Lewisham from flooding and it's full of wildflowers and it's fantastic. It was done by the Environment Agency, Greenwich, um, and actually I think Barclays were slightly involved because they were about to come on site. Thank you, Dave. Sorry. No, I think, I think, I think that's it. Okay, well, we've come to the end of our talk. Um, so it, it just leaves it for me to thank our panellists, uh, David, Sean, and Dusty. Give them a round of applause because they've been brilliant. Um, and I also wanted to thank our, our sponsors, Five Rivers, who weren't able to make it here today, and our media sponsor, Enki. Also, thank you to King's Cross for hosting us, our AV company, Pitch, and SolCell, who have provided us with this amazing off-grid system. So we're literally the first uh, environmental uh, communications uh, and events organization that are managing to take our events off-grid. So that's a fantastic achievement. Thank you also to Voilock, who have provided us with these uh, quite kooky boots. Uh, these and other products are available at Wolf and Badger down in Cold Drops Yard. Um, so we've been working with a whole group of sustainable brands. So you can go and see them there. Um, you can find out more about Planted and the stuff that we're doing by uh, going to planted-community.co.uk. We'll keep you up to date if you sign up to our newsletter. So lastly, thank you to all of you for joining us today. My name's Oliver Heath, and this has been Wasted Spaces. Thank you very much.